Thank you everyone um, for joining uh, the webinar today. Uh, my name is Carly. I am an organizer on the Code Pink Divest from the War Machine campaign and really excited for people to join us on the Draft Women Hell No webinar where we'll be talking about strategies, histories, um, and current efforts to resist um, the expansion of the draft. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Rivera to uh, get us started. Thanks, Carly, and special thanks to Code Pink for hosting this. Uh, we are a network of groups opposing the draft and calling for the total abolition of the draft for all genders. Uh, that includes draft registration. And um, we are excited to share what's going on and what's being done about what's going on. But first, let's just take care of a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first of all, we might have some time for some Q&A. So if you wanna leave a question for us, that, uh, there's a chat box down at the bottom of your, your screen and you can leave a question in there. If you have trouble finding that, you can pop it into the, ch the, the chat box. Sorry, there's a chat box and a Q&A chat box specifically. And if you are on your phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand and we can call on you and unmute you. All right, so that's, that's a basic thing. We're, we've got a full agenda today, so no promises about those questions, but maybe we'll cover everything you wanna know. So uh, first of all, I just wanna say that this webinar will be recorded and you will be able to share it with people. This is an issue that's going to impact all of our young people. It already does. And we do want it to be shared. Um, so I also want to let you know just at the top of everything that Congress right now is debating whether to abolish the draft and draft registration for all genders or expand the current draft system to women. Currently, all uh, males aged 18 to 25 must register for the draft, and they want to expand it to women. We'll let you know more about how and why that happened, um, and in the, it's a big part of what we'll cover tonight. So um, I just want to give you a sense of the overview, and to do that, I'm going to share my screen. You'll get to look at my amazing um, <laughs> desktop. There we go. Great, so we're gonna introduce ourselves in just a little bit, but here is what we'll cover tonight. Why this matters, very important question. Uh, why we're at this crossroads of questioning why to expand or abolish in the current issues that have set up this moment in time. We're gonna talk about feminism, war and uh, war, women and the draft and why this is a feminist issue, not just because they're trying to draft us, but because of the historic legacy of women's involvement on these issues. We're gonna hear from a couple of amazing youth presenters um, about their views on this issue. They are the people who will be drafted uh, and their voices are very important. And then we're also gonna hear from two historic draft resistors. We're gonna share about what has been done in the past and why that offers us some strategies for the present. And then we're gonna talk about what you can do now. Uh, there's a lot of types of actions we can take and uh, we're very excited to share those with you today. So I just wanna start off our um, why this matters section with just saying that, you know, I'm Rivera's son. Uh, I'm not sure if I actually introduced you myself, but I am an organizer with Code Pink and a variety of other peace organizations. And my father was an anti-Vietnam conscientious objector and helped people deal with the draft in that era. For me, I'm part of the generation who didn't have to register for the draft. And let me tell you, that's great. Nobody should have to register for it. Uh, and we're also at a juncture, a critical juncture in time when we can and should reconsider whether we need to have a draft system in the United States. It's really time to end this system. And we'll tell you more about why. And, you know, I also wanna just make a mention that 
the idea of expanding the draft to women is not only objectionable to women, it's sexist, it's um, conscripting women's bodies in addition to our, our men who are friends and brothers and loved ones into a system of war and militarism that has historically been part of the patriarchy, continues to be part of the patriarchy, and continues to reinforce sexist attitudes um, that then in turn cause greater harm and destruction all over the world. So there's a lot going on, but that's one of the reasons it matters to me. But I'm gonna pass the mic to, to Edward Hasbrook, who is a um, historic draft resistor and a, uh, the manager of resistors.info. And I'll let him speak a little bit. Hi. Um, well, I myself faced the decision of what to do about the government uh, ordering me to register for the draft back in 1980. Um, I'll talk a little more about that story later on, but obviously a long time has passed. I'm a lot older now. And, you know, I came to opposing the draft out of uh, being a youth activist for youth liberation and uh, opposition to the ageism of the draft. I think there's a temptation for those of us who are older to see the draft and our opposition to it as something we're doing to protect young people against being drafted. But really the, you know, the worst and the largest number of victims um, of the draft are not draftees, badly treated though they are, but those against whom draftees are used as an implement of war and all of those who are affected by the larger and longer wars that a draft enables. So I think it's important for us to, to reframe this. It's not about us protecting young people from the draft. Young people by their resistance over the decades to the draft have protected us and helped protect us against larger and longer wars. So the task for us as older people and allies of youth today is to carry this the final mile to realize the victory over the draft and by, that, that young people have won for us and by so doing uh, to withdraw this blank check that the draft gives the military. Um, Bill? Okay, well, I, I was a conscientious objector during the Vietnam War. And so I had firsthand experience dealing with an active draft. I went before a board of people that were hostile, who did not believe me, and who really, and, and I came to realize they could determine years of my life, whether I go to jail, whether I live. And so I, that is why I'm here, okay? It's, it's important, and having been, to, been through that, I know how wrong that is, and, and I know that it's important that we stand against registration and the draft. Just this past year, Pentagon officials testified that they rely on selective service as part of their war plan. So it's very clear that, you know, the, 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 even though the publicity says it's just registration, it's not a draft, you're registering for a draft. And that is about forcing people into war against their will. So um, I don't know, Karis, you want to go next? Sure. So hello, everyone. My name is Karis. I am here representing On Earth Peace. Um, and as a draft age person myself and as a peace activist, I am very um, frustrated to hear that the government is currently considering expanding the draft. And I think it's important for us to remember as young people that we are the ones who will be fighting and killing and dying in these wars. And many of us have either never, never lived in a country or don't remember a country that wasn't at war. And allowing the draft to continue just continues to give the government this blank check, as Edward said, to continue these endless wars. And for one person, I would like to see us put an end to this. Um, Arna? Hi, everyone. My name is Ariana, and I'm 20 years old, and I just finished my sophomore year at UC Berkeley. And I'm here representing Truth and Recruitment, which is a project of the Santa Barbara Friends Meeting. 
And our goal is to educate students, families, and school districts about alternatives to military careers, inform families of their children's privacy rights, and advocate for policies regarding re rec uh, regulating recruiter presences on campus. And um, this issue is very important to me because I think um, selective service is institutional and violates our rights. And I think that young people's voices are not being heard enough on this issue. And I'll talk about this more later, but my brother and I um, went to DC to speak at a congressional hearing about this. And we were the only draft age youth for both days. And so that's, that's why I'm here to make sure our voices are heard. And um, Kate, would you like to go next? I'm not a panelist, but hi. <laughs> Thanks, I'm just here to support um, youth and the people on this panel who are telling, uh, sharing their expertise on this issue. And I'm the director of truth and recruitment that Ari mentioned before. Thanks, Kate. I really appreciate your support on this call. I also want to thank Maria from the Center on Conscience and War, who works with Bill Galvin at that organization. And, you know, we're just a sampling of the many people involved in the, the network of groups and individuals opposing the draft. So we're a growing network. If you're interested in joining us, please let us know. Leave a, ch a comment in the chat box. Uh, we're, this is a very rapidly expanding campaign and the timeline is jumping up on it. Uh, and Edward is actually going to tell us more about that timeline uh, coming up next. I do want to say that you know, one other reason this matters right now is not specifically because of the pandemic, but the pandemic is reminding us that we have to make choices and priorities as a country about where we put our resources, what makes us truly secure, and what direction do we want to go in as a country moving forward from this moment. And it is the view of this panel, and we hope you agree with us, that the direction of war and militarism is a waste of our resources and drafting more people into involuntary conscription is not progressing forward in the direction that we hope for our country. So, um, Bill, uh, not Bill, sorry, Edward, why don't you fill us in on how did we get to this moment uh, and what, what's going on right now? Thanks. Well, um, you know, you, you, you can go back uh, to 1980, actually, um, when the current phase of the selective service system and the current registration program was put into effect. Back in 1980, President Jimmy Carter actually proposed uh, requiring, including women, in uh, the selective service registration requirement. Uh, Congress didn't go along with that. It, the issue went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court at that time said, well, as long as the military only wants men for combat, there's a relationship, a rational relationship to only signing men up for the draft. So fast forward to five years ago when Commander in Chief Obama opened up all assignments in military combat to women, it immediately undermined uh, and essentially eliminated the legal rationale that had been the basis for the constitutionality of the current draft registration requirement. And it became apparent to everybody who was looking that once the issue worked its way through the courts, the courts were going to find that requiring only men to register for the draft is unconstitutional. A district court has already uh, made that finding. The government is appealing, but the appeal is only a delaying tactic. So Congress you know, is faced with a choice. If they don't do anything, draft registration will be ended by the courts in a very messy way and a way that embarrasses Congress. So Congress is under pressure to either decide to end draft registration, finally, or to try to expand it to women. They debated this four years ago. They couldn't agree and decided to appoint a national commission to study the question as a delaying tactic. That national commission reported back in March of this year with a recommendation that draft registration be expanded to women. 
legislation has now been introduced in Congress to implement that registration, that recommendation and expand draft registration. But at the same time, as a result that many of us on this call and others have done, uh, legislation had already been introduced and is also pending in Congress that would finally not only end draft registration, but abolish the selective service system and all of the contingency planning that's been going on for a draft. So this is now on the table in Congress. And although Congress is not really doing much other than floundering and electioneering and the pandemic, there are already calls, including by this National Commission, to have this issue taken up uh, through amendments to a pending must-pass military appropriations bill. And again, the clock is ticking. The courts are going to rule. The, the appeals are going to run out. Congress has to do something. They could postpone it for as much as another year, but they may find it much more opportune to do it now while you know people aren't going to march in the streets during the pandemic. Um, and this could actually be considered by Congress in a matter of weeks. Um, we don't know. So it's really important uh, right now, both for people to let Congress know how you feel and to mobilize and be prepared for all the kinds of things uh, that we can do as grassroots organizers, regardless of what the politicians decide. So this is the issue that we now face. Rivera? Great, thank you, Bill. I can see some of our participants are already excited about what can we do and calls to action. And we will, um, we will be sharing those uh, at the end and along the way. And Maria, maybe you can uh, put the, the petition from World Beyond War uh, to contact the senators about the bill abolishing the draft into the chat box so people can take action right now while we're telling them how important this is. So uh, as I said before, I am an organizer with Code Pink. I work locally here in Taos, New Mexico, and I also work on a couple of nationwide campaigns, including representing Code Pink to the National Commission that was appointed to study uh, this very issue. And, you know, I just want to iterate for you all that we made very specific recommendations to the commission. Uh, we also learned, especially Edward, who followed the commission very closely, how much they were cooking the books in terms of who was speaking to the commission and what they were saying and how that got turned into the report and then the legislation that's proposed from their side of it. Uh, you know, they made a lot of statements about young people said this and women said that. And really they tailored who would come to their commission. They drew heavily from the military, pro-military people, but they also had a lot of input from uh, sexists. So this actually comes into play. Uh, I'm going to talk just briefly about gender, uh, why gender equality means abolishing the draft for everyone, not expanding the draft for women. First of all, I just want to say, you know, Code Pink has a statement on this issue. And we're very clear that, you know, while we can't we can't see that there's anything necessarily wrong with having equal service opportunities through the military for all genders. We certainly don't want women to be barred from any particular position because of their gender. Conscription is not the same thing as equal opportunity in an enlistment sec uh, sense, that conscription is involuntary conscription into the military. And, you know, just as slavery doesn't become more just and fair because you add another race to that equation, same thing is true for the involuntary conscription, which is a form of slavery and enslavement of women into the U.S. military. It doesn't make it more just for men. So when the men uh, entered this court case saying women must be included in the draft, it was really a, a, a short-sighted um, reaction. And I'll, I'll just call it horse hours. I felt it was quite sexist of them. Rather than taking the stance that what is just and right is to work together, men and women, to uh, abolish this really harmful system. So the impetus for this is coming out of sexism. It's not coming from women. I think that's very important to understand. There's no woman who is involved in saying, oh yeah, let's draft women. Uh, so no, no women wanted this. And then one of the other problems is, that we face in the feminist angle on this is that there's a whole segment of people who are against drafting women uh, in fact, you can check them out under the hashtag don't draft our daughters. 
uh, please go ahead and tweet back feminism at them. They need a, a little lesson for sure, a teach-in on Twitter. These are people who don't want to draft women because they feel women are inferior to men. Obviously, we do not share that view. Um, we feel that we shouldn't draft women because it's wrong for men to get drafted. And why add to that wrongness? So, um, you know, we have to be very clear that we, it's not an achievement for women to be drafted into the military. There's no achievement there. It's a setback for any gender to have to go through that situation. Uh, you know, we also have to remember that in terms of the commission's report and in terms of their bill to Congress, uh, this issue's definition of feminism and the stance they're taking is that it, it is an advancement for women to be drafted into the military. Uh, you have to remember this stance is actually being defined by organizations that are historically patriarchal, historically sexist, and that it is not being defined by us. In fact, anti-war feminists, including this group, a feminist of all gender, genders, has been very clear that abolishing the draft is a feminist achievement. It is in alignment with feminist principles. It benefits women, it benefits the world, and it benefits people of all gender, genders. So just please remember that. I wanna share with you a quote from the commission's report um, that we felt was particularly noteworthy to share. And this is, this is a direct quote, that women register and perhaps be called up in the event of a draft is, the necessary, is a necessary prerequisite for their achieving equality as citizens, as it has been for other groups historically discriminated against in American history. This is on page 118 of the commission's report. And have you ever heard anything more offensive? Personally, that is just like a slap in the face to me, and I don't take slaps in the face as an anti-war feminism on the nonviolent stance or the women's stance. So um, this is what their viewpoint is, that this is how we're going to achieve equal citizenship is by being drafted into the military. Now, there's a historic pre precedence for this. There's contemporary precedence for this. This is the bogus line that's that was offered to black people that proved false, that proved that no matter how much equality they gained in either advancement in the military or in being conscripted, it didn't equate to social equality. That's why we had to have an entire civil rights movement. That's why we still have to have a Black Lives Matter movement. That's why we still are dealing with racial justice issues to this day. It is the line that was has been offered to wave after wave of in, immigrants, including current uh, migrants who are finding themselves having served in the U.S. military, being deported. Um, you know, this offensive idea that being conscripted against our will into the military is how we women are going to achieve equality is really, it is offensive and we need to call it that. So I just wanna close by reminding us all that, you know, this issue is uh, not just an issue for uh, women, it's an issue along racial justice lines, class uh, justice lines that, you know, again and again, the military has tried to expand the draft uh, to different groups or tried to make people serve. Uh, in fact, Edward told me the other day that the largest draft resistance court trial in history was of interned Japanese citizens during World War II who were told you can get out of internment by being drafted into the U.S. military to fight the Japanese. Uh, like them, many of us probably found that a rather offensive way to resolve that gross violation of justice that was going on. So, you know, please remember that you can be bold as an anti-war feminist of any gender. You can say this is not the route to achieving equality for anyone, let alone equality for women. And that those of us who are feminists have been very clear. We told the commission and we're telling you that what we want to see as an expression of uh, feminism, particularly anti-war feminism, is the abolishment of the draft. Okay, so. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to conclude for this moment and hand it over to my colleague, Karis, to speak about her perspective on the draft as a draft age young woman. Hello, so again, my name is Karis and 
I'm with on this piece. And as a draft age person, I think that it is a horrific thought that myself, my siblings, my peers could be drafted and forced into military service for in the service of wars that we have not been able to, um, we've not been in the legislative halls saying, oh, we want this to happen. We've, most of us not been alive at the times that these wars were started. And for myself, as I look forward and think about the world that I want to see in the future, a world that is more equitable, more just, more peaceful for everyone, there's no way that I can think of that expanding the draft lens to creating that kind of future. And on the contrary, expanding the draft just continues to enable the kinds of endless wars and the kind of outrageous military spending that we've been seeing our entire lives. And um, we as young people need to stand up and say no to this and um, resist the expansion and call for the abolition of the draft because we are the ones who will be the most impacted, not only now, but in the future as we will be the ones inheriting the destruction that these wars have caused. So that is why this issue of abolishing the draft matters to me. And I hope that we can join together and work towards a better future without forced military conscription and without wars and violence. Um, Ariana, would you like to speak now? All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Ariana. And um, I, so I've been working on spreading the message of mili like military involvement with youth um, for two years now since my senior year of high school when I got involved with Truth and Recruitment. And then I was focused on spreading awareness of military presence in high schools. And almost every week there would be recruiters in the middle of my campus at lunchtime talking to students and even coming into classrooms which disrupted learning time. And I talked to my principal about limiting their time there, but he was not receptive. And recruiters would also only visit vocational classes like auto, so they're specifically targeting kids who they thought weren't going to college, which really frustrated me. Um, it was also challenging because other students at my school either didn't see anything wrong with the recruiters or they were too focused on other things to notice that it was a problem. And while I was unable to limit their presence on my campus, it got inter me interested in how the military attempts to get a hold of youth, and I turned my attention to the Selective Service. And in April of last year, I traveled with Kate Connell, the Director of Truth and Recruitment, and my younger brother to Washington, D.C. for the National Commission on Military, National, and Public Service hearings on the Selective Service. My brother and I were the only draft age individuals present, and we gave testimony both days of the hearings to make sure that our voice was represented. And I'm here to say that women will not accept the draft if it's extended to us. We will resist. And I think that the draft is unjust because it limits individual freedoms and promises lifelong punishments if you do not register. Um, young men should not be denied federal aid or a driver's license because they object to war. And I can guarantee that if women have to register for the Selective Service, we would fight back. During the hearing, I listened to panelists make remarks that I thought were blatantly untrue and sexist, and I gave testimony rebuking them. Panelist, the Selective Service Director, Don Benton, remarked that registering for the Selective Service was a rite of passage that young men are excited to do. A rite of passage is voting for the first time or getting your driver's license. A rite of passage does not promise punishments if you don't do it. Um, the Selective Service is not in young people's minds. Most don't know it exists and are even less aware of the consequences it brings if you do resist, so it is in no way a rite of passage. Another panelist, Dr. Mark Kopinger, who is against extending the draft to women, pointed out his granddaughters in the audience and told commissioners that he didn't want to see his granddaughters risk their lives in a war against their will. Then when I spoke, I pointed out how hypocritical it was for him to be concerned about his granddaughters, but not his or someone else's grandsons. My little brother was with me at the hearing, and I don't want to, him to lose his life in a war he was forced to fight. It is not just for anyone of any gender to be drafted against their will. Extending the draft to women is not a feminist act. Eliminating the draft altogether is. It promotes justice and equality because low-income students won't be forced to register just to go to college, and young men won't feel that their lives are valued any less than young women. If the draft is extended to women and I'm told I must register, I will not. I'd rather face the consequences 
consequences than violate my moral values. I can assure you that countless other young women will do the same. And in my opinion, the best way to support youth in this fight is to talk to the young people in your life about the selective service and see what they think and know about it. I think that for many young adults, they aren't aware of the selective service or of the consequences that resisting it will bring, so they don't see a reason to object. We need to start conversations with drafted youth about what it means to register for selective service and how to prove that you're a conscientious objector. Thank you. Bill, would you like to go next? Sure. Okay, well, my name is Bill Galvin. I work at the Center on Conscience and War in Washington, D.C. We were founded back in 1940 to support conscientious objectors to war because of how badly they were treated in World War I. Um, I went before a draft board and, and I was a, okay, just, you know, a conscientious objector is somebody who, under U.S. law, their participation in war based on their moral, ethical, or religious beliefs. And if you apply and are recognized by selective service as a conscientious objector, then you would do alternative service rather than go into the military and fight. And I was a conscientious objector. I, I applied. I actually went face to face with the draft board of people who were hostile. They did not really believe me. They, they, they really gave me a hard time about my beliefs. Uh, I was, my objection was based on my Christian beliefs. They quoted Bible verses at me that they thought justified war. And they asked me, what if we turn you down and we draft you? And I thought, well, and I said, well, I know I can't go in the army. So I guess that means I'll go to jail. And as a 20 year old kid, I was terrified at that. And I know in the depth of my being that is wrong for a government or for anybody to force that kind of a decision on somebody you know, who, you know, who's having to deal with the government. So that's why I've spent my whole life working for justice and peace and, and in support of people of conscience. Now there has been objection to war as long as there's been war. And there's been, a, and there's been resistance to conscription as long as there's been conscription. In the US, it goes back to colonial times. And even George Washington had to deal with conscientious objectors that were in his army. Um, you know, but, uh, but during World War I, that was a very bleak period of our history. I urge you to learn more about it. Center on Conscience of War has information on our webpage. Uh, but uh, there were thousands of objectors to the war in World War I. Uh, they, they ended up in, many of them ended up in jail. Hundreds of them received sentences in excess of 20 years. We know of at least 30 of them that died from abusive treatment. That included torture. They, use, actually, they actually used waterboarding, an early version of waterboarding on conscientious objectors, people who said, because of my values, I'm not going to kill people. Uh, now, things got better by the time of World War II when our organization was founded and there was a nonviolent alternative of a civilian alternative service. And, and a lot of the folks who did that alternative service did, did good things, but there were still thousands of people who refused to cooperate entirely, ended up in the federal prison system. They integrated the federal prison system just by their refusal to abide by the segregation rules. They organized hunger strikes, work strikes. I mean, prison officials really thought they were a pain in the butt to have these folks in the prison. Okay, but, but this is what the life of resistance you know, caused them to live. And then after that war, both the conscientious objectors and these resistors, they formed the foundation of the civil rights movement, uh, the peace movement during Vietnam, the environmental movement, many movements for, for progress in this country. In fact, one of those conscientious objectors taught Martin Luther King about the power of nonviolence. I and mean, he was one of the folks who, who resisted and went to jail. So, so there, there's a long legacy there. Now, by the, by the time that I came along, you know, the Vietnam era, a lot of folks know about the Vietnam War resistance and, and some of the more vocal, some of the more visible signs of the times was draft card burnings. Okay, when you have an active draft, you have a lot of additional regulations, not just register or don't register, but all sorts of other things you have to follow. And one of them at the time was that men had to maintain a draft card in their possession. So actually burning a draft card became a public symbol of resistance to the draft. And there were lots of folks who did that. There were also rallies where they would gather up draft cards and, and mail them into the Department of Justice or the Secretary of Service system as a matter of public witness there. But there were all sorts of other regulations. For example, the draft Secretary of Service had to maintain a file on everybody. And the regulations said that they had to keep like if I sent in a paper I did on Gandhi in college that, that was relevant to my COK claim, they had to keep that. 
And so uh, people started doing things like sending dead fish into the Spectrum Service System. So, so the draft boards had to keep these dead fish in their files. So the, the resistance took you know, many, many different forms. The most common form, by the way, was simply not registered. Uh, but there are also more public uh, witnesses against the draft, like the draft board raids. One of the most famous of them was in Catonsville, uh, where they took, they went into the middle of the day, they took files out of people who were about to be drafted, dumped them onto the parking lot and burned them using homemade napalm. And napalm, and that picture you just saw, that little girl running, that was the, one of the most famous images of the Vietnam period. Uh, it was a horrible weapon that, that the United States was using on the people of Vietnam. And so when they, when they burned the files at Catonsville, they used napalm. And they actually, Dan Berrigan, one of the defendants in his, uh, at the trial, he began his testimony by saying, forgive us, dear friends, for rupturing good order, for burning paper instead of people. And, and this was one of the actions that inspired many actions around the, the country. And one of the most significant was in Catonsville, where, where there was a draft board break in the middle of the night where files were being destroyed. A total of 28 people were indicted. They defended themselves. They, they basically put the war on trial. They said, you know, they, they, they said, yeah, we did it. And, and we intended to do it. But it's not a crime because of the war. And they put the war on trial. They were facing pretty serious punishment, up to 47 years if they were convicted. And, uh, and they were found not guilty. And one of the defendants, the New York Times, in reporting on their acquittal, quoted one of the jurors. And she said, this is a direct quote, we wanted to join the defendants in taking a stand against the war. So I think this is what we have to understand, is that the draft you know, is, is very much an implement of creating war. And if we're about you know, a more peaceful world, that's not so obsessed with militarism, you know, we, we need to stand clearly against conscription. And, and of course, one of the most famous uh, draft resistors and conscientious objectors of that period, of all periods probably, was Muhammad Ali, who clearly qualified as a conscientious objector under the law, but Selective Service officials at the top in Washington said, we can't let this guy get conscientious objector status. And he ultimately won the court, but, but, but that, that was part of what was going on. I want to quickly address two common liberal myths that are used to sometimes support a draft. One is they say that a draft would be an equalizer. Right now we have a poverty draft. Only poor folks are going to the military. Well, look at who was on the front lines in Vietnam. It was poor folks. And everybody knows about, we've heard the stories about Cheney and Trump and, you know, and all the various things that people use to get out of the draft. Draft by its nature can't be fair. It will always put disadvantaged and poor people on the front lines. So that's, that's just wrong. The other thing is this notion that somehow a draft will somehow stop or prevent war. We've heard this a lot. You know, they say, well, if, if you know, people know that their kids might get drafted and go into war, they're going to be more opposition to war and we're not going to have war. Well, we had an active draft in this country from 1940 to 1973, except for one year, 1947. And it did not stop any wars during that period. And in fact, the only reason the Vietnam War was able to continue once the majority of people were opposed to it was because there was this law that said to people like me, you better go or you're gonna to go to jail. And, and I wanna point out to folks that although they stopped drafting people in 1973, the war continued to 1975. So the draft didn't end the war. And in fact, the last, peop the, the, the last year they drafted people, they actually granted more people conscientious objector status than they drafted. So I'm going to turn this over to Ed now. Sorry, I went too long. Well, um, you know, I came of age after the Vietnam War, as Bill was explaining. Um, the draft uh, was put into deep standby. They stopped even trying to register people. And many people thought it was gone for good, but it, it still you know, lingered like the undead. Um, but I came of age during that period um, when I didn't really think about the possibility that there was going to be a draft. And in some ways, that's, I think, like the situation that young women face now or may face, um, who've grown up not really thinking about, well, what would I do if they ordered me into the military to pick up a gun and kill or be killed or, you know, threatened me with punishment if I didn't? That's what I went through, you know, 
and then in 1980, uh, as a political stunt, uh, trying to prove that he was uh, enough of a warmonger to get elected uh, or to get reelected, uh, Jimmy Carter uh, proposed bringing back draft registration. And I had to decide, OK, all of a sudden, what do I do? Um, you know, I came to that at that time as a youth activist, um, later came to more of a pacifist position um, and was exposed to, through uh, my comrades in the draft resistance movement, both to an education in feminism and to an education in queer consciousness. There's a very long, strong tradition um, of queer draft resistors um, and a whole analysis around that. Um, and gay people are among the people who've been promised, well, if you fight, then we'll give you equal rights and see how that's worked out, not. Um, but, uh, you know, I probably, you know, as a college educated white articulate person, I probably could have pitched my arguments in a way that, you know, I might have qualified as a conscientious objector, but most people can't, not only because you have to frame your arguments just so, but only some people qualify. You know, if you believe that there's some good wars and some bad wars, but that the choice is for you to make, which is, you know, like, well, it's what a lot of people call just war theory, um, that doesn't qualify as a conscientious objector, right? Um, but I was more interested in, in stopping the draft than in, you know, trying to find some personal path through it. I spoke out uh, about my refusal to register. And, you know, the government had done this as a political stunt. They were completely unprepared. And they were, you know, the government expects when it gives orders that people will obey. But a fundamental Gandhian lesson is that actually the ability of the government to do anything depends on people being willing to carry out those orders. And that was manifest. I mean, they had an initial registration week where everybody born in 1960 was supposed to get out of the post offices. And the next week, everybody born in 1961. And, you know, of the first four million people in those two weeks who were supposed to show up, a million didn't. And then the government said, what do we do now? They had never planned for how they would actually enforce this and for the fact that there'd been a change in consciousness after Vietnam and Watergate. Ultimately, what they decided to do, because they couldn't think of anything else to do, was, well, we'll throw the book at a few people and make examples of them, and maybe this will scare everybody. And I was one of 20 people out of that million uh, who were picked out as the most vocal non-registrants and prosecuted. And I ended up going uh, for a few months to prison. But it was well worthwhile. Um, because the show trials actually called more attention to the resistance and it made people more aware that there was safety in numbers, that only the people who spoke out publicly could be prosecuted and the registration rate plummeted. And within a few years, the Department of Justice told the Selective Service System, look, this isn't working, it's a waste of time. We're not gonna investigate or prosecute any of these cases. So then we've been left with this peculiar sort of stalemate where for 30 years, Every year, the Selective Service System sends 100,000 names of non-registrants to the Department of Justice, and the Department of Justice sends them to the circular file. There's, nobody's been prosecuted, and they know that a draft wouldn't actually be possible. But on the other hand, there's been no face-saving way for the government to end the draft without admitting failure, empowering young people and older people to more resistance, making us recognize our power. And you know, one of my mentors in draft resistance and in nonviolence generally, Dave Dellinger, who had refused to register for the draft during World War II and went to prison, one of his, he came to my trial in Boston in 1982 and was very supportive. One of his books uh, about the power of nonviolence is called More Power Than We Know. And it's really about this fundamental lesson. Um, and if there is a lesson that I would draw and pass on to the next generation from my own experience is that those of us who were faced with the draft were not, were not victims. We had more power than we knew if we chose to use it. And I think one of the most interesting things about what's happened over the last 40 years is that non-compliance has continued. You know, relatively few people register unless they have to, to get a driver's license in some states or to get student loans. Everybody's well, men are supposed to tell the selective service every time they move until um, they turn 26 and almost nobody does. And in fact, the, the former director of selective service who set up the current system, who was in charge of it in 1980, came out of retirement to testify to the National Commission last year that the program is a failure. 
that the database is so inaccurate that it would be worse than useless and that it's time to give up and end uh, the, the registration program. But that, that non-compliance has been sustained, not because there's been any anti-draft movement. There's no you know, organized vocal thing. People are doing this out of their own uh, spirit totally spontaneously. That's the strength of it. But on the other hand, getting a little ahead of myself, that's why it's so important to speak out because in the absence of a visible organized movement, this spontaneous grassroots phenomenon has been easy to ignore. And the commission really deluded itself to the point where they came out with 400 pages of report and recommendations last month after studying this for three years that included no estimates of current or projected compliance or non-compliance of how many women would refuse if they were ordered to show up and no enforcement plan or budget at all. And this is the Achilles heel, is the fact that some women will say no if they try to expand it, that most men already say no, that the system for men is already a failure and would be a failure for women. That's what I think we need to make, uh, make visible. Um, and for us as, as older people who want to be allies to youth, our task is to help make visible the sentiments of folks like Karis and Ariana and millions of other women who we know would say no if they were actually ordered into the military. We need to make that visible to the country as a whole. Um, and finally, I would say this um, in terms of the lessons here, part of that power lies in the power to create our own possibilities. We were told sign up or go to prison. You know, and I went to prison and a handful of others did, but for the vast majority of people created their own option by saying no. Um, you have the power to create your own possibilities, your own choices, and this is a profound lesson for all of us in all of the phases of our lives. So where do we go from here? Karis, take it away. Hey, thanks. Thank you, Edward. I'm so glad that we could hear from both Edward and Bill on some historic examples of draft resistance and um, we can be inspired and think about what can we do now as we look at um, resisting the draft as it currently stands and resisting any expansion. So as we think about what are some steps that we can take, um, as Ariana mentioned in the chat, one of the biggest things that is really important right now is making sure that young people are aware of what's going on. Um, personally, whenever I was talking to my friends about the fact that I was speaking tonight, almost everyone I talked to was like, what is that? What do you mean draft? Like, what are you talking about? No one, a lot of people in our generation don't know that the draft is still a thing because we haven't seen it in our time. Um, so talking to your peers, if you are a draft age young person and making, educating each other, helping get ourselves aware of um, what the draft has looked like in the past, what is happening now and what we can do in the future is so important. So spreading the word is a big, big thing for us. Um, a couple of ways that you can start to do that as well. You can share the recording of this webinar, um, which will be posted on Code Pink's YouTube, and there will be a link sent out to participants afterwards. Um, we're also suggesting you can use hashtags like um, hashtag hell no, hashtag I object, hashtag abolish the draft, no draft, resist, and I will resist for um, social media. It's just really, again, getting the word out there and getting people talking about this so that everyone can see what we have to say and really hear our voices on this topic. Another thing you can do is sign the petition asking Congress um, to pass HR 5492, which would call for the draft to be abolished. Um, and you can sign that petition by going to worldbeyondwar.org slash repeal. Another thing that you can do is you can advocate with your um, representatives and a good way to get started on that is by participating in an advocacy training. Those are being offered by the Friends Committee on National Legislation, FCNL, every other Tuesday right now. So I believe the next one is happening on June 2nd. 
So if you'd like to sign up for that, you can also visit FCNL's website and get involved that way. And then whenever we think about connecting past resistance strategies to the present, um, as the draft is not yet abolished for um, young men and as we face the possibility that it could be expanded, remember that we have options and we can create our own options, as Edward said. So resistance through non-registration is still an option. Um, registering just before you turn 26, rendering their ability to draft you essentially useless, um, as well as, again, not updating your address. Um, if, if they don't know where you are, again, <laughs> they can't um, draft us. So another way to resist is through um, declaring that you would like to file as a conscientious objector and starting to build your record. So Rivera, if you'd like to speak a little about building a, a conscientious objector piece resume. Sure, thank you, Karis. And thank you for articulating all those many strategies for resisting uh, some that we borrow from historical times as possibilities for our present times. I wanna just point out to everyone who's listening that this is an intergenerational campaign and that is one of our strong suits. Uh, we are very honored uh, as people on the whole spectrum of ages to be standing in solidarity with one another, to have the historicity, historicity this, the historic struggles to draw upon, and also to honor the fact that the very reason we, the, select, the director of the Selective Service could come out of retirement and say this is unenforceable was because of people like Bill and Edward making it unenforceable. Uh, they back up our claims that millions of young women will just say no to this and they won't uh, register, they won't comply. And so, you know, think about the power of this moment together that our, our older generations have put us in this great position and that we can, it's really important to speak up right now. Congress members are sitting on the fence. They don't want to take a stand. They're not sure which way to go. And they would need to hear from you that to counter what the commission says is the truth. So go flood their inboxes, organize all your young friends to flood their inboxes. Uh, that's a very important way of breaking the lies that the commission have, has put forward that were based on uh, rigged testimonies, basically. As Ariana said so clearly, there weren't enough young people speaking to that, that commission. But uh, I do want to mention that in addition to the other strategies we've articulated, declaring your intent to file as a conscientious objector and building your track record of being involved in the peace movement, opposing the draft, uh, being part of organizations like Code Pink, World Beyond War, any of the people on the call today uh, is an excellent way of starting to build your track record and the track record of the young people you love to show that if they ever used a draft, you would be ready to say, no, I'm not gonna go, that you could actually flood the system and bog it down with more COs than they could possibly imagine. So that is a practical, legal, and tangible way that people can resist. And we're organizing programs with Code Pink and other peace organizations to uh, help young people build that kind of peace resume that, that give them merit badges even for being involved in protests, signing petitions, going to a peace team training, things like that. So this is emerging right now. Uh, lastly, I just really want to articulate that the the strategies that we have from our, our young people and our older generations, these are emergent and they're always having more coming forward. So there's room in this movement for your ideas, there's room in this movement for creativity, there's room in this movement for you and for all the young people you know. So please do be in touch with us, get a hold of us. Uh, you can you know, put your, your, your name in the chat box. If you're like me, I want to help with this and we'll follow up with you. Uh, we do have your emails from signing up for the webinar. So you will be hearing from us about what's next. Uh, I want to thank you all for listening. And, you know, I don't know if we have a time for one or two questions that we maybe really should cover, but haven't yet. Maria, what do you think about that? Uh, well, um, 
I think uh, the one I just answered in the Q&A is kind of complicated that Bill might want to address. Why would we not consider um, selective service fair and equal if there are provisions for conscientious objectors to perform alternative service? Well, basically, Oh, Bill, you're muted. One second. Okay. There you go. Hear me now? Okay. Um, but to qualify as a conscientious objector, you have to submit a written application. You have to go before a draft board, and they ask you all sorts of questions. There, it's very heavily weighted in favor of people who are articulate and well-educated and, and probably being religious and having some kind of religious or spiritual foundation also makes it easier, even though it's not supposed to. Um, so right there is is a bias, and I mean we we work with conscientious objectors even now. You know most folks don't realize this, but once you en enlist in the military, if you become a conscientious objector, you can be discharged, and that's a big part of our work right now. And some of the folks really need a lot of help figuring out how to how to. And I'm, to be honest, I'll challenge everybody on this call: sit down and write a statement of what you believe. It's not easy. Okay, so so right there, you know, it make, makes and 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 the reality is, I mean, well, I didn't tell my whole story. My my draft board turned me down, and in the end, I lucked out with a lottery number, so I wasn't faced with possibly going to jail. But if you figure somebody like me, who was at the time planning to be a minister and had the support of my church and my mother and and all sorts of people, and if they're going to turn people like me down, you know, there's all sorts of legitimate folks who just get their claims denied. Bill, if I can you know, just chime in. A, oh, go ahead, Edward. This, this was actually a, a question that the National Commission asked me when I was a, a witness before them. You know, and I think uh, in, a, in a slightly different form, but in ordering young people to do what the government defines as service mistakenly assumes that old people know how to run the world and that what young people need to do is follow what old people tell them to do. It is us old people who have created a world menaced by nuclear weapons, menaced by climate change. If there is a future for this world, it does not lie in more young people following the wrong path that's been set for them. It lies in young people doing what they've always done and finding new paths forward and old people doing what they haven't done in the past as ageists and being willing to take leadership from youth. Well said. Yeah, I just want to add the feminist, the anti-war feminist perspective on that is that e even the system of giving alternative service to CEOs is accepting the paradigm in which our labor, no matter what body you stand in, is available for conscription in voluntary service of servitude, let's say. This is an issue that we have covered with the Civil War. This is the issue we covered when we abolished slavery. This is the issue we covered when we abolished the idea that women would be property. Um, and it's really not acceptable to accept that paradigm even to begin with. Our bodies as women, as young people, are not a bank account of labor for the US government or the US military. And it is time to say that loud and clear, to be extremely clear about this. So uh, I just want to let you know that that's my view on it. Uh, Karis and Ariana, are there any last thoughts that you might want to share? I'd just like to say thank you. To, uh, um, everyone's perspectives and I it's just like an incredibly important issue and I don't think enough people my age are aware of it so I don't know thanks yeah thanks <laughs> okay let's go ahead I think all three of you have spoken beautifully on this um, issue and I completely agree I think that any form of involuntary conscription is unjust. And as Ariana pointed out as well, again, that um, any kind of registering is still a, um, a tacit acceptance of that reality as 
right and decent, and that's not that's not good enough. Hi, it's Kate again. Can I just quickly say um, thank you to everybody? And I did want to say that I talked to a person at Friends Committee on National Legislation today um, because we are going to be meeting with our representative, who's actually a co-sponsor of the bill to uh, expand the military to women, unfortunately. And one of her suggestions, because it's always important to have an ask, was to possibly, um, you know, since he's on opposing, he, he is a, a leader in, in wanting to expand the draft uh, registration to women, that he could at least be available for like a listening session, um, a sort of town hall situation where youth and possibly their families would speak about their experience, um, as well as something that I think Edward suggested that he uh, also have hearings um, on the bill to eliminate the selective service as well as um, the bill that he's co-sponsoring. Our representative Salud Carbajal, uh, who is a military veteran uh, as part of the group sponsoring the bill to expand it. But I thought that was an interesting suggestion as a first step. Um, you know, he may not want to say, oh, I'm against the bill I'm sponsoring, but he, he should be available to listen. And I was just thinking that because someone asked how is how are how do the youth on this call suggest spreading the word and and that was that was one thing I thought relevant. Maria, is there any other question you feel we should exp uh, explore in an extra fifteen minutes on this call? We are at the top of the hour and it might be time to wrap up, but uh, maybe that question of Ariana and Karis, if you wanted to weigh in on, you've been very clear throughout this whole presentation about how to uh, talk to youth about it. Is there anything else you want people to think about uh, in terms of this issue and, and working on it? Um, I think again, just remembering that as like as we've kind of said um this is an issue that's being mostly decided in the congress by the people whose bodies and lives and futures won't really be affected by it in the way that ours will and so it is for us to take sort of take control of the narrative right now and say no this is not the future or the present that we want and i think that does start with becoming aware of um, the past um the past aspects of this issue what's currently going on and what um what kind of future we could be looking at if the draft is not abolished and alternatively if it is how much more um beautiful and equitable and peaceful could our world be without the um sort of oppressive hand of the military industrial complex over us uh yeah i agree i was really really shocked to be at those hearings and to look around and realize that my brother and i were the only draft age youth there and no one on the panel, no one, none of the speakers were able to be drafted. It was only yes. And so I think um, we, it's not that young people don't care about the draft. I think that they've just accepted it as like, that's just the way it is. And I think we just need to spread the word that it doesn't have to be like that. And we can, it's not, the selective service isn't necessary and we can end it. Uh, I just want to chime in and remind us all that the draft, although it affects young people uh, immediately and directly, all of us who love young people, right, all of us, this is our issue too, right? So we're in having an intergenerational campaign uh, like this, we're really taking responsibility for our love for one another, for the fact that we are all tied in that mutual garment of destiny that um, Dr. King spoke so eloquently about, that we don't want to see our young people that we are connected to as friends as family members go to war either we never did 
not in World War I, not in Vietnam, not in the 1980s, and that we are all willing to stand up together to say, no, it's time to end this. And to say to the military industrial complex and the militarism of this country that it is time, it's enough, enough is enough. We are going to set a clear and defined limit in this regard and say that is too much. You know, you have too much money, too much uh, manpower, and we are not going to give you unlimited women power either. In fact, we're gonna withdraw your manpower uh, through the draft because of this. So I just wanna take a minute to give a shout out to Code Pink for hosting this webinar. Uh, if you are looking for ways for young people, particularly young women, to start to build their track record for peace, um, Code Pink does amazing work and every single thing Code Pink does would be something that the US military would look at and be like, oh yeah, you're a CEO. Um, so join their campaigns against this war, that war, and any war. Join their Divest from the War Machine uh, campaign. Work with them in the peace economy uh, network and, and effort. And uh, I could go on and on because they actually are doing quite a lot. Um, Carly, is there any last word you wanna say to the listeners today from the Code Pink side of things? Sure. I mean, first, I just want to say thank you so much, Rivera, and everyone here um, for hosting this webinar. It's been great to hear um, from a feminist perspective why we must uh, resist the draft. Um, so thank you. And I've, I've dropped some links in the chat if people are interested in learning more about the work that Code Pink does. And Rivera, like you said, building up your kind of like peace resume. Um, so people can go to codepink.org or codepink.org slash divest to learn more about getting involved in those campaigns. So. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and we will make the recording available through Code Pink. Um, we will email it to all the participants who registered for this call. Great. Thank you, everyone, and have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you.